Please pray with me. Father, we ask now that you would give us soft hearts and open minds, that you would bless and empower both the reading and the preaching of your most holy word. Amen. The sensation of hunger is one of the strongest sensations, I think, a person can experience. And the feeling of hunger highlights one of our greatest practical needs in this life. Some of you will do almost anything to get food when you are hungry. (laughs) Others of you, when the blood sugar drops a little bit, almost completely shut down and are (laughs) non-functional. And then there is that cross-section of you who just get angry. And you know that hungry plus anger equals hangry. And some of you function in that way. Food is one of the most primal needs of our human existence. When you lack food, you don't do well. And when you go without food completely, you cease to have life. And so it's not surprising that as Jesus presents himself, that he is the one who comes to give life and to give it to the full, that he uses one of the most life-giving, life-sustaining realities, our need for food, to describe the fact that he not only gives true and lasting food, but that he is true and lasting food. And that leads us back to John chapter 6. And so I want to ask you to grab a Bible, if you've yet to open with me to the book of John chapter 6. You might remember that a couple of weeks ago, we saw in the first part of John 6 that Jesus performs back-to-back miracles, followed by a very long discourse about what happened in those miracles. He feeds 5,000 people, plus women and children, by multiplying five loaves of bread and two fish before them. And then he walks on the water in the middle of the night to go be and be with his disciples and provide for their safety. And now we reach the point where it's the next day and beyond, and people are following Jesus. They're following Jesus because they saw this miracle of the food, and they're seeking him for more. And verse 25 picks up this way. It says, when they found him on the other side of the sea, they said to him, Rabbi, when did you come here? And Jesus answered them, truly, truly, I say to you, you are seeking me not because you saw signs, but because you ate your fill of the loaves. Do not work for food that perishes, but for the food that endures to eternal life, which the Son of Man will give to you. For on him, God the Father has set his seal. Then they said to him, what must we do to be doing the works of God? And Jesus answered them, this is the work of God, that you believe in him whom he has sent. And so they said to him, then what sign do you do that we may see and believe you? What work do you perform? Our fathers ate manna in the wilderness, as it is written, he gave them bread from heaven to eat. Jesus then said to him, truly, truly, I say to you, it was not Moses who gave you the bread from heaven, but my father gives you the true bread from heaven. For the bread of God is he who comes down from heaven and gives life to the world. They said to him, sir, give us this bread always. Jesus said to them, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me shall not hunger, and whoever believes in me shall never thirst. But I said to you that you have seen me, and yet do not believe. All that the Father gives me will come to me, and whoever comes to me I will never cast out. For I have come down from heaven not to do my own will, but to do the will of him who sent me. And this is the will of him who sent me, that I should lose nothing of all that he has given me, but raise it up on the last day. For this is the will of my Father, 
that everyone who looks on the Son and believes in him should have eternal life, and I will raise him up on the last day. And so the Jews grumbled about him because they said, because he said, I am the bread that came down from heaven, they said, is this not Jesus, the son of Joseph, whose father and mother we know? How does he now say, I came down from heaven? And Jesus answered them, do not grumble among yourselves. No one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws him, and I will raise him up on the last day. It is written in the prophets, and they will all be taught by God. Everyone who has heard and learned from the Father comes to me. Not that anyone has seen the Father except he who is from God. He has seen the Father. Truly, truly, I say to you, whoever believes has eternal life. I am the bread of life. Your fathers ate the manna in the wilderness and they died. This is the bread that comes down from heaven so that one may eat of it and not die. I am the living bread that came down from heaven. If anyone eats of this bread, he will live forever. And the bread that I will give for the life of the world is my flesh. We can divide this section of this long dialogue into two parts, and those two parts will shape our time together for the rest of this morning. The first part is this, that God gives a gift to the world, (laughs) and the gift to the world is Jesus, the bread of life. The second part is that God gives a gift to Jesus, and the gift that God gives to Jesus is people. And it's interesting that as is expressed in this dialogue between Jesus and the Jewish leaders, there's a human perspective on things on the first point and God's perspective on things on the second point. You might say that all of life can be divided into two perspectives. Now, of course, there's many different perspectives in this room, but two broad perspectives, the human perspective on things and the divine perspective on things, and they're not the same. And, of course, we as humans can more naturally relate to and accept and understand the human perspective on things. And of course, we are not divine. So you might expect that we'd have difficulty or tension with some of the divine perspective on things. And you'll see what I mean by that as we go. But let's start with the first of these two parts. We see in this dialogue the gift from God to the world is Jesus. And this gives us a glimpse into the human perspective. Jesus had just multiplied food before their very eyes. The day before or a couple days before, he miraculously fed thousands of people and everybody there knew and recognized that this food was not purchased at the store or not brought in in basket after basket after basket, that it was multiplying before their very midst, so much so that they thought Jesus was a prophet. And they began to follow him. They followed him to the other side of the lake because they loved the fact that he gave them food. And immediately, he engages them in direct conversation. And he says, do not work for food that perishes but for the food that endures to eternal life, which the Son of Man will give to you. Jesus is saying to the people that are following him, you're working for the wrong kind of food. (laughs) You're chasing after the wrong kind of food. You think that this kind of food is ultimately what you need, but what I'm pointing to all along is that there's something that you need even more. And seeing that he was speaking now in spiritual realities and spiritual terms and believing that he was some kind of prophet, the people replied to him, well, well, fine, you don't want us to work for this kind of food. What must we do to be doing the works of God? And Jesus replied, the work of God is this, that you believe in him who he sent. Now, it might seem a bit peculiar that immediately after he makes this statement, they ask for another sign. You might recall that in the text that they refer to Moses and manna from heaven and 
Moses, our fathers, ate from the bread from heaven that Moses gave them. What sign do you have to validate such a claim? In the Old Testament, you remember from the time of the Exodus that God takes the Jewish people and delivers them miraculously out of the hands of Egypt and they cross over the sea on dry ground and he provides for them every single day, except for on the Sabbath day, miraculous bread from heaven. (laughs) That they would wake up in the morning and manna would be on the ground for 40 years. They were sustained this way. And now, after Jesus performs a similar sign and provides a tremendous amount of food for 5,000 people, they refer back to Moses and they say, well, what sign do you give to validate such a claim that we should believe in you? They just saw a miracle. Why do they need another one? (laughs) There's There's two possible reasons for this. Either either the feeding of the 5,000 was enough of a sign to convince them that Jesus was a prophet, but not anything more. They needed a greater sign to validate the claims that he was making. Or it had been at least a day since he performed the miracle. And they were hungry again. Moses gave our people food Every day, Jesus. And it's almost dinner time. (laughs) And we're getting hungry. And Jesus corrects their thinking. and says, first of all, Moses didn't give you or your fathers the manna from heaven. (laughs) God did that. And he gives true bread for heaven, from heaven that sits right before you. Look with me, if you would, at verse 33. Jesus says to them, For the bread of God is he who comes down from heaven and gives life to the world. And they said to him, Sir, give us this bread always. And Jesus said to them, I am the bread. <laughs> I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me shall not hunger. Whoever believes in me should never thirst. Jesus came not just to give bread, but to be bread. And their response is, in many ways, just like the woman at the well that we saw a couple chapters before. Remember, Jesus is with the woman at the well, and he is he is peeling back the layers of her resistance, and he offers to her living water that she may never thirst again. And she says, oh, please give me this water. I don't want to have to come back to the well. (laughs) She didn't exactly get it right away. And so Jesus offers to these people true and lasting bread that will, will meet their need of hunger for all of their days. And they said, well, give us this bread always. To which Jesus says, I am the bread. (laughs) And if you come, you shall not hunger. And if you believe, you shall never thirst. Now I want to think about that for a second. Think about the nature of this bread that God sends from heaven. And what an incredible gift that it is. What does it mean that God sends bread from heaven? That Jesus calls himself, out of all the things that he could call himself, The bread of life. Think about the significance of that. It is a claim that he will satisfy your hunger forever. And I'm hungry. (laughs) And you're hungry. Everyone has a certain kind of hunger. I wonder what you're hungry for. Success? Recognition, pleasure, alcohol. Maybe you're hungry for relational bliss. Jesus says, I am the bread of life. If you believe, you'll never be hungry again. What are you hungry for? Fame, money, self-esteem, sex, a sense of security for your days going forward. Jesus says, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me shall never hunger. 
So to say that Jesus is the bread of life is to say that he will be the source of meeting your greatest and ongoing needs. That your greatest satisfaction in this life and the will be ultimately provided by this life-sustaining nourishment that only he can give you by his very presence. Now, we could give illustration after illustration about the desires of your heart, but you know what they are for you. I listed just a few in 20 seconds off the top of my head. We could list a hundred more things that you're hungry for, things that you seek to have satisfaction in, Things that we think will get us through. Things that we think will provide nourishment or happiness or that sense of direction or purpose. But the one who created your soul, God himself, sends a gift of bread for you so that you may find true and lasting satisfaction. We see all of those desires that we could list, all of them, could find their ultimate and true satisfaction in him. What an incredible gift. And you can have it. And you can have it simply through belief, he says. Let me read the expressions of how people obtain this gift of God just in this very text. Verse 29, you can follow along if you want. Verse 29, believe in him who God has sent. Verse 35, whoever comes shall not hunger or thirst. Verse 37, whoever comes shall never be cast out. Verse 40, everyone who looks to the Son and believes has eternal life. And so there's an offer there. The offer is for you and for me to come and to believe and to have life and to be satisfied and to never be hungry again. For the things that don't satisfy. And that's the offer that we give to the world when we meet somebody who very much like the rest of us goes through life clearly searching to find their satisfaction someplace else and they continually pull up short because it never ultimately satisfies them. We point them to the one who can satisfy. The only one who can satisfy. Who can meet hunger. Who can give true and lasting life. Jesus. Notice the words that are being used there. He uses two specific words to describe faith. He uses the word comes and he uses the word believes. And those are two different ideas, but I don't think that they're completely separate for each other, from each other. To believe in Jesus, of course, many of us in our time, and we talk about this with some regularity here at our church, that there's this notion that to believe in Jesus is to simply assent to the facts about Jesus. Of course I believe in Jesus. I believe he lived. I believe he's a real person. I believe that he came from God. I might even believe that he died and rose again from the dead. Believe facts about him. But that's not the same as lasting and abiding faith. But when you combine that with the idea of coming to him, I think these terms are used together to describe a more robust or genuine sense of belief that's much greater than a mental assent to him. Coming to him has a sense of humility and desire attached to it. It implies that you see your need for him. It points to a desire to submit to his ways means in some ways that you're seeking to find your satisfaction in him. What a tremendous gift. That God, the God of heaven who created your soul, would seek to give you true and lasting satisfaction forever. This has to be the greatest gift that anybody could ever give you. I mean, think about, we just celebrated Christmas a little over, or about a month ago. I wonder what your favorite Christmas gift was this year. Maybe one or two of you had TV-worthy gifts. The car with the red bow. The diamond bracelet. And you said, that's a great gift. Maybe most of you or many of you had something much less expensive, but something that you desired still, nevertheless. Many of you received a sweater (laughs) and a couple other things that you needed just like me. 
but the car will wear down. The things that you desired will not be desirable to you that much longer, and my sweater will pill, and I won't be able to wear it anymore. But to have a gift that will change your life forever, that will outshine every other gift, that will actually so far outshines and supersedes every other gift, that when you consider its value, puts all of these other material gifts into a much lesser station that are not, are not even all that desirable anymore. Because that is what Jesus is. That's what he means to be the bread of life. It means that anyone who desires to have their satisfactions for this life, for this world, to have their hunger met, go to him, believe in him, and you will hunger no more. What a gift. And so Jesus presents himself to the world as the gift from God for this very reason. But we see that many don't believe him. We see that many of them in this text even begin to grumble about him. We see in verse 36, if you follow along, Jesus even says to them, you have seen me and yet you don't believe. And this begs the question, is God a bad gift giver? Has God failed to meet the most significant needs of humans? Is God giving an undesirable and unwanted gift? And that leads us to the second part of this dialogue. So you remember the first part of the dialogue is that God gives a gift to the world, the bread of life, Jesus. And that lets us into the human perspective. And the second part of the dialogue is that God gives gifts to Jesus. And the gifts that he gives to Jesus are people. And this lets us into the divine perspective gives us a glimpse into what's happening in the mind of God and the workings of heaven and eternity. And what we see in the second half of this text is that God is actively and sovereignly working to draw people to himself. And whenever he does that, somebody puts their faith in Jesus. <laughs> whenever God places his hand on somebody or sets before them the desire then they do ultimately come to a place of belief. Let me show you where I see this. There's five statements in this short text that indicate this perspective of heaven, that God is indeed the one who initiates the saving of people and sees it through to its end. Verse 37, all the Father gives will come to me, Jesus says. And whoever comes, I will never cast out. Verse 38, I have come, Jesus says, to do the will of him who sent me. And that's connected to verse 39. What's the will? <laughs> this is the will of God, that I lose nothing of all that he's given me, but I will raise them up. Verse 44, no one can come to me unless the Father draws him. I will raise him up. Verse 45, everyone who has heard and learned from the Father comes to me. And so God gives, God draws, God speaks, God teaches, and the human heart responds as God brings them and gives them to Jesus. And so we have a point of tension here. And I know that when we get to this point of tension, some people get upset. Some people might feel like the freedom is impinged upon. If God is the one who changes our hearts, our minds, who God is the one who acts first in salvation, if it's not simply up to my choice, which I believe to be from a neutral position at some point. And we're not looking for controversy, but we have to deal with the words that are very much right in front of us, that the words of Jesus himself. And so on the one hand, we see that Jesus says that he's the gift to humankind, that whoever believes will have eternal life, and that people are held responsible for their choice. And it would appear that God has failed them because many people aren't believing in him, even though it says everyone who's heard and learned from the Father comes. Has God failed in that way? And on the other hand, we see that God is sovereignly acting in drawing people toward belief, and he actually gives those people to Jesus to keep. 
And here we see that God is wildly successful because every single one that he draws, he draws to belief. And everyone who truly hears comes to faith. And everyone who is truly taught by God will come to Jesus. And they will be kept by Jesus and raised by Jesus on the last day. So this is a tension. Divine sovereignty and salvation and human responsibility for our sin and for our belief and for our unbelief. We see that God acts first in salvation, but I don't think that that violates our sense of freedom. This is what I mean by that. We would say that true freedom is found when you get to do what you want to do, right? But here we see that these people who are coming to Jesus want to come to him. They are doing what they want to do because God has drawn them irresistibly because they've seen light piercing in the darkness, even the light piercing in the darkness of their own hearts. They've seen love expressed to them in ways that are undeniably desirable. They see food that will quench the hunger pains of their soul. And they see forgiveness that overcomes their guilt and their shame for their thoughts and their words and their actions. At this point, some will say, well, how do you know, Pastor Nick, or how does anybody know if they're a person that God is drawing or God isn't drawing or God is working in or God isn't working in? Well, it's pretty easy. (laughs) If God draws, do you know if you're a person that God draws? They come to Jesus and they believe. How do you know if God is giving that person to the Son? They come to Jesus and they believe. How do you know if God is truly teaching them and they are truly hearing? They come to Jesus and they believe. What a tremendous gift that God gives to open the eyes and to unplug the ears so that people would truly see him as the bread that satisfies our most deepest longings and our soul. There's a tension. It's difficult to resolve divine sovereignty and salvation and human responsibility but it's undeniable in the words of Jesus. And so we are called to believe in him. (laughs) And we see that God uniquely draws all those who come and he gives them to Jesus. Oxford theologian Robert Lightfoot comments and describes it this way. He says, so long as a man remains and is content to remain confident in his own ability, without divine help to assess experience and the meaning of experience, he cannot come to the Lord. He cannot believe. Only the Father can move him to this step with its incalculable and final results. Dutch theologian Rank Kuyper describes the tension between divine sovereignty and human responsibility in the word picture of having two ropes that are hanging from a ceiling and are connected above the ceiling by a pulley system. He says, I liken sovereignty and responsibility to the two ropes that go through two holes in the ceiling and over a pulley. If I wish to support myself by these two ropes, I must cling to them both. If I cling to only one rope, I'm going to fall down. (laughs) I read the many teachings of the Bible regarding God's election, predestination, his chosen, and so on. And I also read the many teachings regarding whosoever will may come. And urging people to exercise their responsibility as human beings. And these seeming contradictions can't be reconciled by the puny human mind. But with childlike faith, I cling to both ropes. Fully confident that in eternity I will see that both strands of truth are, after all, one piece. We could say so much more about this, but time escapes us. Let's summarize this way to say, God accomplishes his work in salvation through giving his son to people and giving people to his son. (laughs) God accomplishes his work in salvation by giving his son to people, and by giving people to his son. And I want to give you five reasons why God's sovereign hand in salvation is good news. There are a lot of reasons, but we have time for just five quick ones. 
Five reasons why God's sovereign hand in salvation is good news. Number one, because this means that he will never let you go. He will never change your mind, his mind about you if you truly believe. Friends, we are so prone to changing our minds about all kinds of things, about little things and about big things. Some of you changed your mind three times this morning about just what you were going to wear to church. Some of you have made more expensive decisions and changes of mind. (laughs) You changed your mind about a car that you bought recently or even the house that you live in. Some of you have made significant decisions and mistakes, even relationships. You changed your mind about the person that you married. Or maybe they changed their mind about you. And that ended in a divorce. I am so happy that Jesus will never change his mind about me or about anyone else that truly believes in him. Why? Because verse 39 says, I will lose nothing of all that he has given me. You are found secure from this one who will never cast you out because God's sovereign hand is present in the salvation. Number two, this is good news because God's giving us to Jesus means that we are guaranteed to be raised again to eternal life. And you see it all over this text. Look at the rest of verse 39. Jesus says, I will lose nothing of all that he has given me, but I will raise it up on the last day. Verse 40 says, I will raise him up on the last day. Verse 44 says, the one who the Father draws comes, and I will raise him up on the last day. We will not be forgotten by God. His work will be completed for us and to us by physical resurrection from the dead and the glorification of our bodies. And that is good news. Number three. It's good news that God's sovereign hand is present in salvation because the fact that God gave Jesus to the world and believers to Jesus means that we can truly have satisfaction in him. That the promise of the bread of life is not just an empty promise or a pithy word picture. What Jesus means is that our deepest desires can truly be met in him. And when you truly taste him, you don't want to go back to the other things that you sought to find your satisfaction in. But when we're struggling in our sin and our temptation, even momentarily as it might be when we become short-sighted, or when we seek those desires that we know ultimately won't be satisfied, and we find them to be unsatisfying, it points us again to how glorious he truly is. And so we cling to him, and we trust him, and we abide in him, and as we do that, we experience joy of true and everlasting and satisfying life, and that is Good news. Number four, this is good news that God's sovereign hand is in salvation because it fuels our evangelism. It means that I don't have to trust how persuasive I am when I share the gospel with somebody, or I don't have to be devastated when the person I've been praying for and thinking about and pursuing with the good news of this bread of life for weeks, months, or even years still reject him. It means that where I go and who I talk to, God is at work and drawing people to himself. It's guaranteed. And so we evangelize with boldness, and that's good news. And number five, finally, this is good news because it is rooted in the will of God. And there's nothing stronger than the will of God. Verse 39 and 40 speak that this is the will of the Father, that Jesus would lose none that have been given to him, and that this is the will of the Father, that all who believe will have eternal life. And there's nothing stronger than God's will. And the fact that God grounds this in eternal decree means that it will never be shaken, lost, or moved. He is God. 
To be God means he's all-powerful in his nature. It means that he sees everything. Nothing is out of his sight, and nothing that contradicts his will will stand. Isaiah 46, I am God, and there is no other. I am God, and there is none like me. Declaring the end from the beginning, from ancient times, things yet done. Saying, my counsel shall stand, and I will accomplish all my purpose. And this is good news. And so let me close with a simple invitation to come. With the way that we walk through life. As we try to navigate these things together, remember verse 32, Jesus says, my father gives you true bread from heaven. He gives it to you. So come. So come to Jesus and believe in him. He came not just to give you bread, but to be bread. He came that you would be freed from the present cycle of hunger, seeking satisfaction that you might have but will never satisfy. He came to forgive you and to purify you of your sins so that you could live a life abundantly with God forever. No matter who you are or what you've done, come. (laughs) Come to Jesus and believe in Jesus because he is the bread of life. Let's pray together. Lord God, when we weigh such direct and significant words from Jesus, we can't help but know that souls are at stake and that eternity is in the balance. And so I pray that for any here today who have not yet put their faith in them, in him, but now sense the wonderful and magnificent drawing of your spirit that today would be the day where we yield to him and seek him to satisfy us and to forgive us and to provide for us forever. Father, I pray for those who have already expressed faith in him, the Lord Jesus, that we would be reminded afresh that we need not seek satisfaction in other places. That the things that so easily catch our gaze or tempt us to stray will never satisfy, but Lord, that we can see and be reminded of and know and experience that you offered lasting and true satisfaction in him. Help us to abide in him in such a way that we know that and feel it and enjoy it forever. God, we thank you for this tremendous gift of bread of life. Amen.